here we go. Somewhat of a pop-up. Max Bernier is my guest. He's the leader of the People's Party of Canada. If you're looking at his Facebook, I'm sorry, his Twitter account right now. I am the producer, the host, and <laughs> working all the dials today. Max, I really appreciate your time. How are you doing in these crazy times? More than anything, I want to know how you're doing. How are you? Oh, hang on a second. Did I lose him? Oh, shoot. Hang on one second. Hang on one second, Max. <laughs> I turned you down. Sorry about that. Start again, Max. Sorry about that. I am no, not a very yeah, good producer yeah. today. <laughs> I just said, Jim, that I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon and taking some time to relax a little bit. Yes, I'm feeling good. Uh, I'm feeling good, but uh, I cannot say the same about our country. And uh, but personally, you know, I'm training, uh, I'm running every day and doing some weight and try to stay in shape. And I like what I'm doing. I'm looking actually forward to uh, travel across the country and uh, do some rallies like I did uh, before the election. Okay. All that with this uh, COVID-19, it has been postponed, but I hope I'll be able to be back on the road as soon as possible. Okay, I don't want to dwell on this and I want to get into current topics, but for the people out there, and I mentioned to you just before we went live, I'm recently red pilled over the last, like five years ago, I was in the middle of a Green Party election. So I'm very politically active. I can argue both points of the spectrum now pretty well because I know the lefts so well. Um, tell me specifically and anybody out there that is a conservative that feels a little bit of lost hope, you know, because I think there's a few of us, maybe more than a few out here that are wondering, why didn't you just lay in wait and wait for another opportunity to take over the party, the conservative party? Why not play the game until you made it to, the, and I mean, outside of ideological differences with the leader, because the leader's gone now, and right? And so it's just so difficult to launch a new party. I voted for you last time because you speak to the issues I care about, free speech, uh, biological facts, guns, media bias. Uh, dude, we are so in sync, it's unbelievable. So just, I don't want you to spend too much time on it, but your thought process on when it just became on a ten, uh, you know, impossible to, com to continue under the conservatives. Well, for, first, Jim, maybe uh, I can start by why I went to do politics uh, in the first place in 2006. I was in the private sector before 2006. I was uh, VP of a, a, a bank and also an insurance company. And, uh, you know, I decided to jump into politics in 2006 when Stephen Harper asked me. And, you know, my goal was to have a smaller government in Ottawa fighting for more freedom and personal responsibility. Uh, you know, I believe in people. I don't believe in big fat government. And uh, I was industry minister. I did a big uh, deregulation in the telecom industry with more competition and the, the price went down. So that was a big success. And um, so I had different position with the upper government. But after the 2015 elections, uh, when Stephen Harper decided to uh, to just uh, quit politics uh, after the loss, uh, I said, you know, I have a lot of ideas. Uh, we uh, we know, and me and my team, what would be good for the country. So I decided to run. And uh, maybe if you remember that, I was uh, ready and we had a strong platform based on four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect and fairness. And, you know, I was debating these ideas with the other uh, candidates. And at that time, as you know, Andrew Scheer won the leadership, but uh, I was not supposed to win. And at the end, I had 49% of the vote mm -hmm. and Andrew Scheer 51%. But the biggest challenge that I had was to have the support of my uh, colleagues, uh, the conservatives MPs. Um, at that time, we were 99 uh, conservative MPs, and um, I had the support on only five of them, including myself. <laughs> hmm. So uh, when I, and they didn't support me because, you know, uh, I was speaking against the uh, cartel in milk, dairy, and poultry, and a lot of uh, my colleagues were saying, you know, I have a big dairy uh, uh, 
dairy uh, industry in my riding, so I won't support you because, you know, they won't vote for me. I was against the corporate welfare, no more subsidies to uh, big uh, businesses. And a lot of my colleagues uh, told me at that time, you know, I have GM in my riding and then I cannot be with you. And so, you know, they're looking for their own uh, re-election and they didn't want to have these uh, debates about these ideas. And that's why I didn't have a, a lot of support from my former colleague. But that being said, I had a lot of support uh, in, the, in the party with the membership. So answering your question, why after 49% I didn't stay in the party, I tried to, um, I was, uh, you know, all these ideas were very popular. So with, with the membership, and I tried to work with the establishment of the party with uh, Andrew Shear for 15 months. And at the end, uh, Andrew Shear told me, Maxime, we won't take any of your ideas. We won't take any of your policies uh, for the next election. Uh, they are too bold and uh, the country is not ready for that. Mm -hmm. And so now when you're speaking, uh, you don't engage the party anymore. You're speaking for yourself. And so I said, you know, what is the goal? It's running for a party that you don't believe and a conservative party that's supposed to be conservative and was not conservative at the end. So I said, you know, I cannot be in that party anymore. And um, after 15 months, uh, I resigned and we created the People's Party of Canada based on the same ideas and, and the same platform. So I said to people, if you like our ideas, come with us and uh, help us to create this uh, political party. And um, actually, Andrew Shea was right. Uh, when he <clears throat> ran during the last election, the platform was a uh, centrist, if not a leftist platform and he tried to please everybody without any conviction. And I think we did a good campaign. And at the end, yes, we had 1.6% of the vote. But that being said, for a new party after a year, as you may know, it took 20 years and six elections for the Green Party of Canada to have more than 1.6% of the vote. And we did that in our first year. So now we have to consolidate that. And I'm looking at the new leader right now, Jim, and uh, it's worse than Andrew Scheer. Uh, is, he said, uh, just after being elected, that his goal is to split the liberal, uh, Liberals' vote. And uh, I think he, he's doing that. Uh, they share the same view on the climate change. They will impose more regulations and, and more taxes. And uh, as you know, I don't believe in climate alarmism. And you look at the platform of the uh, Conservative Party right now, uh, what uh, Aaron O'Toole is saying, is speaking like Trudeau. And so this party is not conservative anymore. And uh, that's why we have a huge opportunity at the next campaign. And I won't go back there. Uh, actually, look what happened with uh, uh, the other uh, candidates that were speaking about uh, conservative ideas and balancing the budget the candidates that were that were running against her tool during listen we don't hear and they don't they don't have the right to speak because what they were saying during the campaign it's not the position of the conservative party so they have to follow the line they have to follow a tool and you know i think it's better to be outside and creating that party and yes it may take some time but uh, I think the time will be on our side. And now uh, with the Trudeau government and the conservative that are having the same policies, we're the only real uh, conservative party and the only real one that is fighting against globalism, against uh, climate alarmism uh, for uh, our Canadian sovereignty. And we don't do any pandering. And I think people appreciate that. But uh, I must admit that uh, I won't be prime minister after the next election. Mm. Our goal is to consolidate. And if we have one, two or three uh, candidates that uh, will be elected, we'll be able to bring that conversation at the national level and influence. And I think that's important. So we'll see what will happen. But um, I'm confident that the time will be on our side. We just have to be patient. I appreciate your thoughts there. I just joined my local Conservative Party of Canada. Never thought I'd do this, but a friend of mine 
who's actually a pastor in town here, K.R. Davidson, said he was going to run for the conservative nomination just internally. You know how that works at the EDA level. They blocked him. So I paid my 15 bucks. I actually had signed up a couple members. He signed up 300 or more. I think uh, the party maybe has got about average eight, eight, nine, ten, and then maybe a thousand members or something like that. So it it was a big chore. And they just, they blocked him. So there's no democracy there. I want my money back. I can't vote for the guy. And my heart was, my last vote was with you. I mean, when you talk about immigration, I know that people say, oh, that's racist. No, zero illegal immigration just stop coming across the border and anything other than a checkpoint so i get that you know man the conservatives are speaking more like the liberals all the time i don't know how we come back from this indoctrination through the media i know that wow have i ever woken up to the the false narratives been uh perpetuated on us and just continually all from the media and and left wing government. I mean, Justin Trudeau comes out the other day, and I carried the speech live, and they're just selling fear. And I'm like, wow. So, uh, I wonder if we could just shift gears a little bit and come back to today. Right now, we're facing lockdowns, code reds, mandatory masks in my region here in Niagara and St. Catharines. We have a regional, sorry, a regional health official that's been appointed by the province. That is not elected or accountable to the regional government. We have a two-tier system here, th- uh, 12 communities yeah. and then a region. And he just slapped restrictions on all bars and restaurants that if you don't live at the same property, not only is there only four people allowed at the table, but they check your ID when you come in. And if you don't live together, you can't sit together. Like, where does it end? Yeah, that's... Uh... You know, they're acting like uh, a communist country, and that's a shame. And actually, if you look at the data, the most important data is the number of deaths. And, uh, you know, the goal was to be sure that it's not increasing too much. And, you know, it's not like like it was uh, during the March and April uh, of this year. Uh, So they are looking at the number of cases. The number of cases can increase. But the most important is the number of people in the emergency room in our hospital, and that's under control. So I think they have a power trip right now. When I'm saying they, the provincial government, uh, Ontario one, the Quebec one, uh, Legault was saying in Quebec uh, last yesterday, actually, that, you know, you can, you'll be able to celebrate Christmas, but no more than 10 people with you (laughs) and your family. But uh, the... The new is if you won't be able, you have to stay alone and you, we don't allow you to have a guest at your house. So it's crazy. Uh, and the restaurant, you know, cases are increasing and the restaurants are closed. So that's not coming from the restaurant and bars. And these people invest a lot of money to respect the regulation in the beginning when they were saying you can be open, but you will have to have 50% of capacity. They did all that. They, they did some did huge investment. And now maybe half of them will go bankrupt. And and it's, it's, it's crazy. I think there's another way to fight this uh, coronavirus like other countries like Sweden. They didn't have any lockdowns. Uh, they don't have mandatory masks. And if you look at the data, it's better than here in Canada. So, and you look, you can look also just south of the border. Uh, some states in US are doing better than Quebec and Ontario without any lockdowns. So, you know, uh, it's, um, they're, they're, I think, I don't understand. I don't understand politicians <laughs> that, you know, it's there, it, it's our freedom. And, and at the end, you know, yes, you need to protect the older, but mm-hmm. you can do that without uh, locking down the economy. The and after that, and after that, Jim, what we have to do, the government will compensate businesses, but these people don't want to have a grant from the government. What they want is to be open and to do business. And actually, we mm-hmm. don't have money, as you know, we have huge deficit. So we are giving money to compensate all these industries. And at the end, you know, let them leave and let them open, let them do business. That's the, uh, it's, it's sad what happened right now in our country. Mm. 
Uh, from the standpoint of recruiting candidates or recruiting votes, uh, I just want to give you a chance to differentiate yourself from the conservatives. And so your, you know, your short elevator pitch of, you know, let's say you've got a high school student that's voting for the first time and they're liberal leaning because they're becoming a school that way, basically. You know, what, what are some of the points in your, your quick hitters as far as, well, here's why you should be with me and not them? Well, first of all, if you believe in this country, if you believe in yourself, if you want to have more freedom, if you want to be able to do what, what you want to do in life, uh, if you want to have a brighter future, a more prosperous country, you must vote for us because look at our platform and our, at our policies, you'll see that we are the right policies for bringing more prosperity in this country and more freedom. And what I'm telling them, you know, I won't try to tell you what you want to hear. I'm not like that. We are doing politics differently. Just go and look to the speeches that they delivered a couple of uh, years ago. It's the same thing today because I believe in that. I believe that we must have a smaller government. I believe that we must have a government that will respect our constitution, that won't interfere in provincial jurisdiction. So, and I don't try to tell you what you want to hear as, as a voter. And what I try to do, I try to have policy and we have policies that are good for all Canadians. And look at the conservative. The conservative, they are pandering. They are pandering to every special interest group, uh, you know, and, and they are saying something a day and maybe the opposite the other day. Uh, you know, they are, they are not doing politics based on, on, on some conviction or ideas. They're doing politics, they're looking at the poll, they're looking at the survey, and, and they're doing focus group to know what to tell you and how to tell you that. I think, you know, I'm looking at you, a Canadian, as an, uh, an adult, and you know better than a politician in Ottawa what is good for you. When I'm telling, I'll give you more freedom, I'll lower your taxes, I'll, you'll be able to have more of your own money in your own pocket. We, we won't have any... Uh, uh, we won't send money outside in other countries to help to fight climate change in Africa or to build roads in Africa like the Trudeau government is doing and the conservatives believe in that. We will bring back that money home to help our people here in Canada first. So I'm telling you, you know, <laughs> and the big difference is I'm not appealing to your emotion. Usually politicians like to appeal to your emotion and send something that, you know, I want you to to appeal to you uh, to your intelligence, and, and we are doing politics differently. We have smart and policies, and I'm asking you to go on our web. website and look look at what we're and I'm, I'm honest, uh, and you know I don't I, I, you know I don't have time to waste also personally. Uh, I'm 57 years old. Um, I was in the private sector before. Uh, I, and now I'm in politics. I was a member of parliament until 2019. And I'll be back. I'll run again. And I hope I'll win my seat. And I think I will. I'll be back in parliament. I'm doing that for the future generations. I'm doing that for the youth of today. You know, it's, it's irresponsible, the deficit that we have today. We are paying for, for it right now, but also will pay for a long time. Our children and grandchildren will pay for it. So that's what I'm telling them. Look to what you want this country to be and look at our platform and you'll see that, you know, we want this country to be prosperous. Spend some time red pilling our crew that's watching. Now, I mentioned to you that this has happened for me over the last five years. It's been painful. I didn't expect it to be. But then, you know, I've done a lot of uh, Jordan Peterson's lectures, like all of them, yeah. several times. And I remember in one session, it just finally hit me. I think I was just ready to hear it as you can't expect to change the lens that you see the world through and it not be painful. I didn't realize that my loyalty, you know, 
existed all the way through my belief system and that changing my belief system would cause me pain, not to mention the ostracization I've received from people that, oh, I thought you know, I knew you and you used to be so intelligent. Now, you know what? All of a sudden, just because I'm not an, a fan of late term abortion or I don't want illegal immigrants coming across our border and I think that more gun, more gun laws aren't going to make a safer community or that, you know, the media lies to me every single day just because I've changed my stance what we can't be friends now and i seriously mean that friends and family some of the best or that i thought knew me the best just are gone so spend a little bit of time making the points that you would make trying to red pill because for me it was it was very organic i watched some crowder and i'm like oh okay yeah life starts at a conception that's biological fact come on stupid <laughs> yeah. uh, whether or not you want no, i'm not looking to ban abortions i'm just saying can we no i'd even go to six months can we just stop having third term abortions that that can we at least make a law that outlaws that like again i'm not trying to make them illegal but and then you know i'll watch a little bit of i don't know crowder then uh, i think you know uh, shapiro because shapiro really argues both sides and he he will call the republicans out in a minute i, I appreciate that i know he's con ink a little bit and then other you know Cassandra fairbanks and i just started thinking geez this is all wrong i don't believe that i'm not 24 anymore and so uh, uh, just give me an opportunity to kind of bring the same elevator pitch as far as red pilling somewhere. If you're going to say, dude, d so what I like to do is back up to a point of agreement. So most pro-choice people <laughs> will agree that anything after six months should not be allowed. You can get most, it's only the radical, the really radical left-wing feminists that say my body, my choice right up to nine months and they exist and they have the biggest mouths. And I back up to a position where, okay, so can we agree no late-term stuff? Most of the people will say, yes, yes, nothing after six months. If you can't get your shit together by that time, then blah, blah, blah. And so I like the how Crowder does that. He backs up to, okay, so we disagree here. Let's go back to where we agree. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, but uh, uh, politicians in Canada don't want to do that debate. They don't want to do that debate. Uh, I don't know why. I did that debate at the last election. Uh, I said, you know, I'm, I said, we need to have this debate and late term abortion is, is wrong. And, but, you know, it's uh, the feminists uh, were saying, you know, Bernier, Bernier, you know, is against us. And uh, the, the, the argument on the other side, it's, it's my body. I can do what I want mm -hmm. with my body. But the real argument is after six months, that baby is, is a baby just waiting to to be out in this world but uh, i had a very good candidate Loraline thompson Loraline was uh, uh, running in alberta and she said at that time you know i have a bill i wrote my bid on abortion late late term abortion that will be the bill that i will table in the house if you elect me and i had a journalist calling me bernie are you for that i said yes i'm for that i'm for that, having that debate and we must have that debate because mm. you know there's a lot of countries that have legislation like that in europe uh in uh, in the us so they have that debate and we cannot have this debate so i think that's why our voice is there i'm saying to people you need our voice you need the PPC voice that's important on abortion on other subjects like that uh, i'm not afraid and yes sometimes the mainstream media will tag you and say okay bernie is anti-feminist bernie is like that but at the end you must fight fight back and that's what i'm doing I didn't think I was going to go this direction, but a friend of mine is Greg Vesna. He started the None of the Above Party because uh, well, Canada and Ontario wouldn't bring None of the Above as an actual voting option onto the ballot. Then Ontario said, well, we won't give you the name. He said, I'll sue. And 10 minutes before he went in for the injunction, they said, fine, we'll give you the name. So he's now called the None of the Above Democ Direct Democracy or Depart Party or something like that. And his constant, and this is a bright guy. He's been on... Um, in the early 80s, he converted a, a car to ammonia fuel, NH3 gas, and you can burn ammonia. I didn't know this. And it's a huge, it's huge for the economy. But, you know, big business and big oil and whatnot, I don't know, lack of political wills kept it down. Now, he always 
talks about follow the leader basically to slaughter so are you giving your candidates a little bit more room i know that the last election you said i'm not going to tell my candidates what to say as far as pro-choice are you giving them a little bit more latitude and how religiously for lack of a better term do they have to stick to your main platform pieces before you're like hey hey it's not the ppc anymore yeah so first of all you're right they have a lot of uh, uh, freedom but the most important for me they must be on our side on our four principles individual freedom personal responsibility respect and fairness and i'm asking them to speak first about our platform to speak about our platform on immigration on uh, ending uh, corporate welfare on uh, no more climate alarmism on balancing the budget i told them that's the most important we want you to speak about the platform but if they have another uh, uh, subject that is very important for them and in line with our principles go for it go for it and, and we'll have that debate uh, I, I cannot control them and I, I want I don't want to control them also now I've actually said this question before and I appreciate your time um, I know you're well, at least last time I spoke to you, you were not a fan of proportional representation. I wonder if yeah. you've changed your tune now as far as the standpoint that, uh, man, if you get 5% of the vote nationally, I want you to have your 5% of the seats in the House. I know it leads to more minority governments. Vez, again, another guy, uh, this is something that Steph, uh, you know, stuck with me from my lefty days. Vez actually recruited me to the Green Party back in 93. He's worked, he helped Trudeau get a, get elected leader, like inside. The, he's, he's worked with everyone but the NDP. And, <laughs> you know, I know you've said, nah, proportional representation doesn't, doesn't work for me. I wonder if your thoughts have changed on that at all, because it just seems unfair that, you know, well, Harper was elected with 37% of the vote. I was a lefty back then. Now we got Ford at 41% of the vote. He's got all the seats and no opposition. I think a healthy opposition is, is good for democracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to have a healthy opposition. We don't have that in Ottawa right now with the conservative. They're afraid to speak uh, against uh, lock, lockdowns and, and climate change and all that. But uh, answering your question, I want to respect the Constitution. I know that Another system like the proportional will be uh, very uh, good for us. Uh, it would be easier to be in parliament. It would be easier to have more uh, candidates elected. I agree with that. But, uh, you know, I don't want to reopen the constitution and do that debate. We don't have the best system, but it's a good system. And I'll be able, you know, I'll be able to be elected and we'll be able to elect. Maybe it will take more time. But I'm okay with that. Uh, we, we still have a lot of uh, bold reforms that we must do. Uh, and I don't want to reopen that and speaking about that. Uh, I want people to understand that immigration is important. That's the future of our country. We want a moratorium on immigration because right now we have the coronavirus crisis and, and the unemployment rate is very high. So let's have a moratorium on immigration. And after that, you know, and, and actually... Uh, only legal immigra immigration and uh, and a maximum of 150,000 a year economic immigrants. So we need to have that debate. We need to speak about that. We need to speak about, you know, <clears throat> being able to balance the budget and doing the reforms for being able to do that. I don't want to reopen that and having that discussion. Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, I'm confident that under that system, I'll be able to be uh, back in Parliament and maybe with uh, a couple of other uh, other uh, candidates. Until then, Mike Schreiner's had some success working outside yeah. until he was um, elected. Now he was elected in Ontario. Maybe Elizabeth May to a lesser degree uh, being able to influence before she was elected. So until you're elected, how do you make your mark? How do you influence or lobby the existing, in most cases, uh, majority governments that really don't have any opposition at all? Forget listening to a guy that doesn't even have a seat yet. Yeah. So, so you're right. Uh, for me, having a seat, that would be important because I would have, first of all, more coverage with the mainstream media. Uh, it would be now it's very difficult for me to be in the mainstream media. Uh, that's why I need to travel across the country. It's easier for me to be in a local newspaper and local radio station. So that's why we, uh, we are planning a tour. 
as soon as possible. But if you look at the Green Party, I think they want the debate. They have only three MPs right now. But look, the, main, the big mainstream uh, establishment parties, the conservative and the liberal, they have a, a green platform. They've adopted they all the their deba- big points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they want the debate with only three MPs. They have, you know, the, 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 the conservative, they, 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 are, they agree with the Paris Accord, the liberals, and they're doing everything. So it took some time for them, but they want the debate without being the, the official opposition, without being in government. So for us, we need to be out there, and that's a big challenge. That's why I'm doing more uh, uh, YouTube videos, and I'm present on Instagram, on, on Twitter, on Facebook. But I will travel across the country and do interview with the local newspaper. It's it, it's harder for us to be in the mainstream media, TV, or a national newspaper. But I'm um, these uh, establishment political parties, and that will be easier after that. So, you know, we're at 1.6. If we, if at the next election we are at 5% nationally, <laughs> that's a big win. Uh, I'll be, I'll participate in the national debates. I'll be able to, to do a lot. But yes, right now it's very difficult uh, to be part of that national debate because they don't want. The conservatives don't, don't want to have any debates on immigration because they know 76% of their membership <laughs> want a moratorium on immigration. 76% of them. So they don't want to speak on immigration because that's not their policy. They don't want to speak about uh, you know, um, having a, a new, a new uh, formula for the, uh, the um, equalization formula, the money that uh, the West is giving to the East. Uh, I said, you know, we need to change that program. We need to have a new formula that would be less generous, that would be fair for every province. But they don't want to have that debate because they know it can be harder to have support in Quebec and in New Brunswick. But <clears throat> I was doing that debate during that last campaign, and I believe that people understand that these, that policy right now is not fair because you don't give any incentive for Quebec or New Brunswick to develop their own natural resources. There's no incentive to do that. So you need to have a transition period, being less generous, changing the formula. And it's important also for the unity of this country. I understand the Western alienation, and, and they're fed up with that. But the, the conservatives don't want to have that debate. So that's why we, I, I need to push. I need to be there. I need to speak about it. And I'm using all the platform that I can. But uh, when I'll be back in Parliament, they, uh, they will have to answer. They will have to answer all these questions. Uh, hypothetical question. You're um, eligible. You think you're on a path to be elected and there's a chance you could win. What's the first kind of things, if you had a magic wand and a majority government, what's the first thing you'd tell voters, okay, uh, when I become prime minister tomorrow, here's the first thing I change. And how does it kind of impact you know, the average Canadian. Because I think, and before you start, I think there's this idea that we're more divided than we ever have been. And in some cases, that's true. I think what we fail to realize or acknowledge is that the moderate middle is the fat part of the bell curve. And we all live in there, liberals and conservatives of all, uh, uh, as well. It's just out on the edges where the radicals are just losing their mind and they've got the biggest mouths. So we think they speak for everyone, but we forget that the... The 95 or 97 percent of us that are in the fat part of the bell curve are mostly moderate. We agree on a lot of issues. Absolutely. Uh, And we have a lot of support to do a lot of reforms, but we need the courage to do it. So my first uh, my first action will be to stop illegal immigration and uh, the Roxanne Road in Quebec. We need to stop that, and it's easy to do it. So we'll do it. We'll have a moratorium on immigration. We'll have a national discussion on immigration. That will be a first step, a very important first step. And after that, you know, I will cut foreign aid. We can save maybe $8 billion there, and I'll bring back that money home. I'll help our people here in Canada. And also I will, uh, I will look at every uh, cent that we are spending for the UN, the and I will look at all that, and I don't think we'll need to be part of the uh, uh, global migration compact 
or the Paris Accord. So we'll end that. That's easy to do. We'll look at all our spending and we'll be sure to be able to balance the budget in four years and we'll look where we can cut. No more, no more corporate welfare, no more subsidies to big businesses. So there's a lot of things to do. But I think the first step will be to uh, stop illegal uh, immigration, to uh, stop foreign aid, to bring back that money here, to do the reform to balance the budget, to have the discussion about this uh, uh, <coughs> equalization formula. You can have, you, I don't, we don't need to have a conference with uh, other premier all across the country to change the formula. It can be done in one meeting, a cabinet meeting in Ottawa, starting Wednesday at nine o'clock, ending the same Wednesday at 12 o'clock, and at 12, <coughs> sorry, and at 12 o'clock, you have a new formula that is less generous. That's it. It's under the jurisdiction of the federal government only. So I'll do that reform, and that would be important also because people out west, it, it's important for them, and it's important for people also in New Brunswick. They want to have a richer province, and they want their province to have policies at the financial level that will, <coughs> that will, that will give the incentive for the private sector to develop their own natural uh, resources. So we can do all that. We can do all that in the first month. What about the unintended consequences of cutting subsidies? If like, if we take big oil, for instance, I don't know how many billions of dollars we pay out in corporate welfare. You'd have a better idea. But what if we just look at the big oil industry for the amount of money that we give them every year for R and D? It's I mean, it's just a subsidy. It's corporate welfare for sure. And then the price of fuel goes up as a result is that a natural market influence that you want to take place because ultimately we want to be off you know dirty energy whether whether you believe in climate change or not uh, we want to be shifting towards and i hate this word a green economy because you know and this is something that's left over from my green days you know if you tax bads on healthy choices and then as a result that makes them more expensive that's not necessarily a bad thing so if we cut subsidies and all i mean all, all of them we're giving them a, and literally giving them away to big business forget the graft and the big contracts like hydro and windmills and stuff like that you know if we just look at big oil and that and that you know the green party used to say yeah if it influences the price at the pump, at least it's full cost accounting. You're dumping your garbage into the air. You shouldn't be able to do that free. So if it has an impact on prices, is that something you welcome? Uh, first of all, yes, you're right about subsidies. Uh, ending subsidies, when I'm saying that, it's to all industries, to the the uh, uh, the uh, gas industry, uh, every industry, uh, the, the automobile industry in Ontario, you know, you cut all that, and the way, and and you'll save about. Uh, we did the, we did the calculation at the last election. It's about five billion dollars that you can save a year. But what we can a year. So what you can do with that five billion dollars? First, I want to have a flat tax rate for every single business, so it would be fair for everybody. Ten percent flat tax rate on businesses. So you'll take some of that money. And after that, you'll have also more money to be sure that we'll be able to lower taxes to Canadians, to the individual Canadian. And I think that's important. So the market, uh, I know that the green technology is coming, and, uh, but you don't need all these subsidies right now because what you are, uh, I'll take the example of uh, uh, electric cars. Electric cars, the subsidies that you're giving, and you're giving a subsidies to the rich to buy a Tesla, and that's unfair. So you need to end that. And when they will have the technology, the green technology that is efficient or more efficient, the cost will go down. The cost will go down and people will have more choices. Hmm. I appreciate your time, man. What's uh, what? What are you doing now, as far as laying the groundwork? I know you talked about a tour. I don't know anything about that. So tell us a little bit about that, and then uh, are you running a full slate the next time allow, around? What's your position on when that might be? I, don't, I can't see how the NDP can continue in good conscience or in good faith to prop yeah. this government up, and you can't count on conservatives or the or the block for you know. It seems like they take turns. Uh, you know, supporting them to keep them in power. But, you know, Jagmeet Singh is the last guy. To, I mean, I I can't see him 
you know, I'm not a big lefty anymore, never been an NDP guy, but I can't see him as anything more than just an enabler of corruption right now. You know, I had somebody on the other day um, who's connected to another local activism, conservative guy, and he said, hey, we've got a criminal, like straight up criminal as prime minister. I don't know if you take that strongest stance, but your comments on that. <clears throat> but f first of all, speaking about the election, uh, I agree with you that uh, Trudeau had the support of the NDP uh, for the, for his speech of the throne, and that's why they're still in government. But I believe at the next budget in February or March, he will have the support of the NDP or the Bloc Québécois because he's buying support mm. with money that we don't have by you know uh, Great point. and and. Yeah, increasing our deficit. So I think that Trudeau will be able to pass his budget. Uh, and I don't think so personally that we'll have an election this spring. But as the leader of the People's Party of Canada, we have to be ready. And we had 315 candidates at the last general election on 338 uh, ridings. So our goal will be to have a full slate of candidates, 338 candidates. We want to give the opportunity to every single Canadian to be able to vote for the People's Party of Canada. So what we will do, uh, I think a lot of our candidates will come back and so we'll have to find maybe a, a couple of, uh, uh, maybe 100 or 150 uh, new candidates. Uh, we'll take time to do that and that will be open nomination. We are starting the process right now with our membership and our EDAs, our organization at the local level. And uh, our goal is to have a full state of can can candidate that will be uh, uh, appointed and ready for the next general election uh, if it's uh, this spring. So that's, uh, that's something. And what I'm doing also, I'm in touch with uh, our members and our EDAs, and we are working on the platform also for the next campaign. That will be almost the same platform because it, our platform is based, as you know, uh, on our principles. And we will need to update our platform. Like I said before, I said during the campaign that we will balance the budget in two years. That would be impossible because of that uh, enormous <laughs> deficit. We will need to uh, do that in four years in a mandate. So we'll need to look at all that and how we're going to do it. So that will be part. We'll need to update our platform. But what I want to, to do also, because a lot of Canadians don't know that we exist. That's our biggest challenge. They don't know the PPC. They don't know our party. So we'll need to run a campaign. We'll have our, our policies there. But we will need to focus on maybe four or five priorities. A little bit like Harper did in 2006. He had his five priorities. And we'll need to focus on that. So I can tell you that immigration will be a, a priority because we're the only party who's, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is uh, speaking for a, a moratorium on immigration and, and other subject also. So we'll have a discussion with uh, our members to pick uh, five or four of our uh, priorities that would be in line with our with uh, our principles or part of our platform actually right now. So it's something that we're doing with our members and that would be important. And I will ask our candidates to focus on these four or five priorities to be sure that people understand, okay, Bernie is the only party who, uh, that want, wants a moratorium on immigration. Uh, the PPC is the only party that is again globalist and globalism uh, and they want to keep our, our 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 country sovereign and we don't want the U un to tell us what to do so we we will need to to and look at another way maybe to uh, speak about our ideas uh, giving more arg arguments to our our candidates and we will think about that also but we have time and i think the next election will be a nice challenge and I can tell you that the more people will know about the party, the better it will be. I'm not a big fan of conspiracy theories, but the more I look at what's going on, the more I wonder, what are they doing? This globalist, this great reset, this idea of welfare for everyone, of you know, shutting down businesses while the Walmart stay open. It just looks like, it seems to me that the liberal governments that have a majority are 
trying to break us, like our will, our economic standing, our hope, and every like. Do you buy into this idea that if you're not broke and weak, you don't then then you don't need the government, that nobody votes liberal anymore? Like I, I keep looking at this, like I'm trying to understand why, why the lies in media, why the lies from government. I'm in I'm pulling my hair out watching Justin Trudeau at the press conference the other day, and Max, I want to tell you. When, when Justin, I was so anti Harper that when Justin Trudeau made the walk with his gender neutral, when, when they're gender yeah. equal, I was hopeful. Even a guy like I mentioned, Greg Vesna, intensely political, actually bought into the fact that maybe this guy would do something to help us. And then, so I gave him the room to fail and he used it up. But I just wonder, you know, what your take is on this globalist you know, the great reset, all this kind of stuff, the UN, um, man, it just seems like a conspiracy to break us. Yeah, but first of all, uh, the Trudeau government and other governments believe in socialism uh, and they think that they know better. They want to impose their point of view. And it's not only in Canada, it's in other countries and the UN, uh, look at, look who's part of the UN, the UN for them, it's bureaucrats and bureaucrats like to have more power. And so, and, and actually they really believe that socialism is the solution for more prosperity. But we had, we know that it's not working. It didn't work with the uh, uh, Soviet Union. It didn't work with China. China is to be, uh, they, they had to be more pro markets to develop their economy. So, but they strongly believe in that. And also I believe personally that the mainstream media and journalists in Canada all leftists and they believe in that so they're all together and they don't want to have any opposition when you're saying something that they don't like so they won't print it or if they print it they will try to make you look uh, bad and, and, and crazy but I, I understand and people understand and people are not crazy they know what happened right now with uh, all, all that socialism that is imposed by our provincial or federal government. And uh, that's why, you know, the more you speak out there against that, the better it will be. But uh, it, it's a big task. And yes, it's a big task. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to fight and I will fight because I know that we have the best ideas. Our ideas are based on the Western civilization on believing in people and the government won't solve any problems. Usually when they pass a regulations or a legislation, they're, they're creating more problems than they're, they are solving. So you need to believe in people and yes, you need to have a fair free markets and open border for goods and services, but you need also to decide your own law on immigration. And we don't want that to be imposed by the UN. So there's a lot of, uh, of reform that we must do in this country. But uh, I think people, they, they understand, they can see that socialism is not working. We have to explain that. And, you know, that's, that's what I like. I like to speak about ideas and, and, and try to convince people. And the more, the more opportunity I have, the better it will be. Max, I really appreciate your time. Just on the way out, talk to me, man. Is there any way, and I don't hold you to, to this, but is there any way we come back? Now, I'm not sure if the media has been all this left wing before. I think I'm more sensitive to it now, but I honestly believe that I used to watch CNN 10 years ago and I didn't get the feeling that they were lying about everything. It seems like some great democracies in the world have turned away from socialism and gone to more conservative values. When you see it deeply entrenched in our learning institutions and in our media and our government, is there any hope that we come back from this? So I appreciate your, your crystal ball thoughts on what happens if it goes too far and what's the natural progression of the pendulum swinging back and when does that God please when does that start <laughs> yeah but but all these leftists you know uh, that started in university uh, and so now they were in university uh, 25 years ago and now they're they're working and they're working in media they're, they're, they're so 
they, they, they have a huge influence. And that's why we have all this socialism all over the cross. So what we must do, we must do the same thing. Uh, we, we must be out there. There are some think tanks like the Montreal Economic Institute, the Fraser Institute that are doing some work and try to promote free markets and freedom and a smarter government. But we must do more than that. And uh, I, I understand that they're in control right now. But uh, you know what happened in the U.S.? Uh, Trump uh, was elected uh, for the first time, and nobody, nobody saw that coming. But there's a Senate majority somewhere, and, and uh, I believe that these people are, are there, and we are able to change that. But, you know, we, I think we must be patient a little bit. The, the worst is the Conservative Party of Ottawa, uh, in Ottawa that was supposed to defend all these ideas, they are now leftists. So that's a big disappointment, but at least the People's Party is there and we will never do any compromise with our principles and people must understand that. So I'm offering them an option because the Conservative Party is not an option anymore. How do you contain your rage? I just want to know on a personal level because I'm I don't know if I go looking to be offended every day. I think that's a little, you know, that's inherent to a lot of us. Um, but I'm I, running. See, I see some of I, this. No, but you've been very diplomatic. Uh, you speak your mind without personal attacks. You draw, you talk about issues instead. I have a hard time doing that because I, I have so much fun ridiculing people and their, their ignorance. So how do you can like one, like, I mean, there's certain things I look at and I'm like, what that like I, it enrages me that Antifa runs free. But, uh, you know, you get an anti lockdown march and, and they're somehow <laughs> spreading, spreading everything. So I just wonder how personally you contain your 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 rage because it's got to drive you crazy. And you just want to be lashing out all the time. I know you're the leader of the party, but yeah. doesn't it ever get the best of you and you just want to freak out? <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm like you. I'm like you, Jim. You know, I'm freaking out with what I'm seeing right now. And, and uh, you know, I was in Toronto. I was in that march for uh, and, and the lockdowns. And they had a, a protest every Saturday. And I was there, I think, two or three Saturdays uh, with people. And that's giving me a lot of energy to, to continue and to fight. Uh, but also, when I'm, I'm mad about that, you know, I'm going to go for a run. <laughs> I'm gonna go for a mm. run for a 5k or 10k run, <laughs> and, and when I when I when I'm back after that, you know, I, I can just a little bit relax. But yes, when I'm reading the news in the morning, mm -hmm. or social media. Oh, my connection's packing. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Max. I'm not laughing at you. I've got a connection issue here. We've probably broken the stream. It looks I like. have to be more. Oh, here we go. Oh, did I lose him completely? Oh. <laughs> the, sometime I must fight and uh, a little bit harder, and that I'm ready for that. Uh, I'm sorry, brother. I had a technical issue. We lost a little bit of that last part of the stream there. So I think we probably got interrupted on the, uh, maybe just on, I'm sorry, Max, we missed everything you just said. So if you, you can know, repeat okay. yourself, that'd be great. And then I'll let you go. I promise. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's okay. No, I was saying, you know, the way I manage <clears throat> my temper oh. when I'm not happy with what, what I'm reading in the news. Right. It's running and, and, and doing some sport. But mm. at the end, <laughs> my goal is to be able to speak with Canadians. And if I'm too aggressive, people won't listen to what mm. I have to say. So I, I have to be calm. But at the same time, Jim, I must admit that sometime in some interview with the mainstream media, I need to be aggressive. Mm. I need to put them at their place. And, and I, I, won't, I will do it. You know, I will fight for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're reading the news, listening to the news, it's a little bit, uh, you know, tough because mm -hmm. you know that we have a lot of work to do, but I'm ready for that. 
I appreciate you, man. Much love. Uh, you're a good man. I really appreciate your character and your inflexibility for what you believe in. I know that doesn't come across as probably the most negotiable as far as a politician, but you stand your ground. I love that. You might even... Uh, I don't know. You might even pull me out of retirement for candidacy. I don't know. I almost went for you last time. Um, and then I hope and, you will next time. Well, you know I what? Hope you I hope next time, Max, Jim. I almost voted conservative to stop my local liberal guy, which is the most strategic voting to me is like a, the greatest sin. And I almost I considered it. And I'm like, you know what? I couldn't do it, man. You had my heart. I don't know who the, who the local candidate does. It didn't matter. It was like, I'm in sync with this guy, you know? And that's what I have to rock some road is like one of my things. I, I just, here's a place where, and I tell this story to my friends all the time, illegal immigrants with their luggage, with their Gucci luggage, maybe not so much that, but th yeah. these are not poor people, yeah. even though they might've come from poverty, maybe six countries ago. I mean, from Africa to all these South American and yeah. Central American countries, and then all the way through the States. And they ended up on Baroxam Road from Africa or wherever. And then they roll their luggage across. They're greeted by border patrol, I suppose, put in an ambulance, driven to a hotel to wait for their welfare. And I'm like, yeah. like you don't know who these people are. They, my, I won't, somebody said the other day, I paid all my life into CPP. And these, I'm not going to say what they said, these people are getting more money as soon as they cross the border as me at 75 years old paying into CPP my whole life. And it's just wrong. Like Roxham Road for me is just a, like, again, even when you, you come off as a, as a, as an intolerant bigot, if you say just no more illegal immigration like that, you know, I, I understand the moratorium on all immigration right now, especially when we're unemployed, massively unemployed. Yeah. Uh, but if you just take the the moderate position of I want to stop all the illegals from coming coming across, yeah. like just get tight with the border, like it it seems like it's just everyone knows about Roxham Road. Absolutely, and that's why we are seeing a moratorium because we want to have that national debate on immigration. We need to have that debate, and I'm pushing for that. So yes, no more illegal immigrants, and and when will uh, when will have after our moratorium, our goal is to have economic immigrants, people who are coming here that are coming because they have a job in Canada, because the uh, employer uh, were not, was not able to find a Canadian for that job, and it's okay. So we want these people to be able to integrate our, our society, and the best way to do it, it's when we have a job. Now all these refugees who are coming here are fake refugees, like you said. We, we want to help the real one that are waiting in a uh, in a camp somewhere in Africa. You know, you need to help the real refugees. And these these people, sorry, but their life is not in danger when they're coming from the state of New York. So uh, sure. let's end that as soon as possible. I promise this is my last question. It's four oh two. We're right <laughs> on time. Uh, who are you friendly with in the media? Who are you getting? Who are you enjoying getting your news from these days? Who's actually giving you a fair shake in Canada? And maybe, like, I, I can't imagine that you're listening to any Canadian news right now because it just seems so one-sided. At least you got Fox in the states, but our Newsmax is making a huge gain. So, who are you still kind of friendly with in the media that gives you a fair shake? And who are you getting your information from these days? Well, the information on, on the, you know, on the internet, you know, I'm reading, I'm reading newspaper in the morning. I'm reading the New York Times. I'm reading a Canadian newspaper, uh, and, and also La Presse in French. So, but I, I'm, I'm, when I'm watch TV, it would be more Fox News, sometimes CNN, just to see what mm -hmm. they're reporting. Um, but usually I'm reading the news, I'm reading the news and I'm on different, uh, uh national newspaper, but, um, uh, I'm not impressed. <laughs> I'm really not impressed, but by why I'm reading. Mm. Uh, and, um, the, I have a good relationship with, uh, the radio station across this country in Vancouver, in, in Toronto, they will have me on board. They will, uh, and that's easy. But on the mainstream media, if I'm doing a press conference, they will cover it. Like uh, I did a press conference when I was running for the by-election in York Center. 
they will cover it and uh, that's okay. But, uh, you know, I, I, don't have, I don't have a good relationship with journalists, Canadian journalists. When I'm saying a good relationship on ideas and, and, uh, and, and they don't want to have me because they don't want to have this debate and they don't want to give me the opportunity to speak to a lot of Canadians. And so uh, it, it's, it's like that. But that's why I want to come back on my tour. When I'm doing a tour, now I'm able to have a discussion with the uh, traditional newspaper and radio station and doing rallies and speaking to Canadians. And I'm looking forward to start that as soon as possible. Thank Martin for me for the follow up. Uh, he came out of nowhere, and uh, I, I appreciate that. He, uh, you know, I've been going back. I've been chasing you a little while, but uh, I appreciate the follow up. So, and him lining that up. So, and your time today. So, thank you very much. All the best to you. Just a closing statement on the way out, if you want. Yeah, but thank you, Jim. I'm, <clears throat> I'm very pleased that we take some time, and that's important for me. And I'm, <clears throat> I know what you're doing, and you're doing a good job. So. I hope that a day you'll be a candidate for the PPC. <laughs> all right, my brother. I love you. Thank you for all your hard work and for your frankness. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Enjoy what's left of your weekend, brother. Don't work too hard. Thank you, Jim. All right, Bye-bye. Bro. We'll talk soon. There's Max Bernier if you need him. I always knew. Uh, I mean, I had him on last uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he was a great conversation, and he didn't disappoint today, so I appreciate your time. Thanks, Max. Wicked. Awesome of you to come up, and awesome of me to be doing this while my Eagles are taking a beating. Seriously. I I don't book stuff on the weekends. Uh, the contact at the PPC followed me up, telling me, well, we sent you a reply, but you didn't reply, and I think we got our wires crossed because I don't think that actually happened, but they did follow up anyways and then landed in, landed Max for me within seven days. So that was great. I appreciate that. Um, and he was a good conversation last time and now I just brain farted, but oh, I was talking about my Eagles. I don't do stuff. So they booked me. They said, okay, 3 p.m. Sunday, EST. I'm like, yep, yeah, done. Because I'm not going to try and massage the date. They got me booked, 3 p.m. Sunday, I'm a go. I'm not going to say, um, um, can we do it at 4.30 because i got to watch a football game. So I just <laughs> I just sucked it up, and now i got to watch this. Like, this? Rushing yards as Yeah, it's, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I probably get cut for just even that little tiny clip. <laughs> 22 to 10, not cool. Bewley, what up? Bears suck. Um... Thanks for checking it out today. I appreciate your input. Some of you had questions uh, today. I didn't get a chance to hit the comments. Uh, my greatest appreciation to Max Bernier. Man, I don't know. He just lines up with all my stuff. And, you know, I'm flexible enough that and I admitted to Max, I gave Justin Trudeau all the room to fail. Uh, to impress me, but he failed. And I, I was hopeful for him. I thought I was so anti-Harper that I was, I was tweeting out, it's a new day. So it's not like I started out hating him. I always knew he's a bag of hammers. I, I know that he's not the most intelligent guy in the world. But here's the thing. Here's how, how Trudeau has done this. One, his father's last name. Two, he's put really clever political people around him that know how to get elected. That's how you get elected, by surrounding yourself with political geniuses. And Trudeau's done that. Now we're facing a love fest between Trudeau and the NDP that keeps them in power. And then well, the bloc will prop them up. And then the conservatives will even prop them up again. And I don't know, man. I, I wish I had more hope that a guy like Maxime Bernier... Oh, I like where his heart is. I like where his convictions are. I like him as a man. I like his character. I like his presentation. He's far more diplomatic than I could ever be, I guess. Well, I mean, I've been diplomatic as a as a candidate, but no, I also call it like it is. And uh, I'm not afraid to get dirty in the mud with, you know, pointing to character flaws. <laughs> Anyways, I really appreciate the time. Thank you for joining. I'm going to go back to this. So
Oh, I can put the red zone on. Is this going to get me shut down just playing the video in the background? I don't know. Um, what else I got coming up? Oh, I got a guest for Monday at noon. His name's Mike Farkas. Mike Farkas is the local rising star. I don't know. Legend. A uh, witch with a lens. G3 is his business. Let me see. I haven't, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't planning on outing this right now. Uh oh. Uh, let's see here. Where's G3? How do I do this? Sorry, Aaron. You probably didn't know that that was coming. G3. Uh, what do we call it? Design, photo, and video. Mike Farkas. Monday at noon will be in my company. Forget the Zoom. When I said to Farkas, I've been thinking about you. You've been on my list for a long time. I want to get you in. St uh, like, do you want to do the show? Where's this page? Oh, he probably blocked me from the page. No, I'm kidding. Here we go. Mike Farkas, Monday at noon, he's going to be in the booth. This guy, what, what does he call himself? Well, first of all, if you look at my profile picture on Twitter and Facebook, Mike took that uh, when I emceed for the My Son, the Hurricane show at the uh, Moose and Goose and Thorold many years ago. He is the master of darkness. Uh, what is it? The, the prince of lighting? I don't know, but let, just look at this. <laughs> you, you can recognize Mike Farkas he just the lighting he nails and he's not afraid to be dark uh, just a talented talented guy I enjoy Mike as a human being uh, last time I saw him I didn't worry about the fist bumps I just put my arms around him and gave him a big man hug <laughs> so Farkas thank you very much brother I'm looking forward to spending some time with you Monday at noon we're going to go live he's going to be here and m n I mean noon sharp we're live so wherever you're watching it now you can watch it then peace love hug your neighbor and how about you ditch that mask huh how about you just rip that thing off and say you know what I'm just going to keep my distance and wash my hands. Look at this. Speaking of studs, revive the rose. I was at the show, outdoor drive in show. Look at the guy. Look at the light. Like, this is straight witchcraft right here. My boy, Mike Farkas. Thank you very much. Uh, Monday at noon. Peace, love, hug your neighbor, and rip your mask off. I'm out.